Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Sally Elbert. Uh, and before we start, I want to thank two people. First, Bill Weinshot. He provided the photo of Harrison Horton Dodd uh, a number of years ago, actually, that, and verified that the photo is indeed that of Harrison. <clears throat> he was, um, at the time this picture was taken, he was a member of the Elks here in Fond du Lac. And it was at least 15 years ago that a gentleman from Beaver Dam, Kevin Deer Zimmel, emailed me and introduced me to Harrison Horton Dodd and his past. I want to thank him for sparking my interest as well as providing a great deal of information. Uh, his help allowed me to further research our former mayor. I'm just sorry that it took me this long to put it all together. Um, Von Leck's Forgotten Copperhead. Commodore Harrison Horton Dodd. He was a Von Leck mayor, 1874. He was a BPOE, Elks, uh, exalted ruler in 1902. He was also a Copperhead, founder of the Sons of Liberty in Indiana, and a convicted traitor. This is the... Uh, one of his obituaries, when Harrison Horton Dodd passed away on the 2nd of June, 1906, Fond du Lac newspapers all ran large obituaries for him. At that time, we had several newspapers. The three most prominent were the Journal, Fond du Lac Commonwealth, and the Fond du Lac Reporter. Proclaimed as one of Fond du Lac's most prominent citizens, he was known as Commodore because of his love of racing his yacht on Lake Winnebago, and as was well known in Oshkosh as well as Fond du Lac. Cause of death was an acute attack of heart failure, according to his obituary. The courthouse death record revealed that he also was a victim of dropsy. He was 82 years of age at his death. He was born in Brownsville, Jefferson County, New York. It was said that he lost his father when he was quite young. However, it has been determined that his father did not die until March of 1861 when Harrison was 36. One of the newspapers claimed he was possessed of undaunted courage and ambition, and his rise in the estimation and respect of his fellow man was rapid. In addition, the paper states that the first part of his life was spent at Brownsville. Then he lived in Toledo, Ohio for a time, eventually coming to Fond du Lac in 1869. Newspapers did not especially here in Fond du Lac, did not report the in-between time when he lived in Indiana and Canada. And it was not reported locally that he had been sentenced to be hung as a traitor by a military court. In 1868, Harrison was transferred from Kalamazoo, Michigan's American Express Company to the same company here in Fond du Lac. In Fond du Lac, he became head agent, a position he held until his death. Apparently, Fond du Lac citizens did not realize or ignore the fact that when Dodd lived in Indianapolis, supposedly running a printing company, he was instrumental in starting the Sons of Liberty. It was known as the most important copperhead in Indiana. Oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, a copperhead, for those of you who do not know, as a northerner during the Civil War, who was sympathetic to the southern states, usually to the point that he or she gave some sort of support to the South. It could have been monetary, it could have been just their support. A co the Sons of Liberty made up of Copperheads. It was an organization during the Civil War that was a subsidiary of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Harrison began and was leader of the Sons of Liberty in Indiana. This Sons of Liberty popped off the Knights of the Golden Circle. They started in 1850, supposedly ceasing all operations around 1916. The Knights of the Golden Circle was the largest, most dangerous, subversive organization in American history. Membership exceeded 48,000, perhaps more at its height during the Civil War. Their economic and political goals were to create a prosperous, slaveholding southern empire 
extending in the shape of, the, of a circle from the proposed capital at Havana, Cuba, which is right here, for 2,500 miles in a circle. Therefore, the Golden Circle. The, it was to take up the Caribbean, Central America. Uh, the plan called for the acquisition through purchase or conflict, whichever was convenient, of Mexico. It would be divided into 15 new states to shift the balance of power in Congress in favor of slavery. Their economy would be fueled by cotton, sugar, coffee, indigo, and mining, all by slave labor. Eventually, the Knights spawned the Ku Klux Klan as an offshoot of that organization. Most of the official records from the con Confederacy disappeared when Richmond fell during the Civil War. They've never been found. The documents included records of the Knights of the Golden Circle. The Knights gained wealth by theft and a lot of looting. It was rumored that both Jesse James with the James Younger Gang, as well as John Wilkes Booth, were Knights. That wealth, mostly in gold, was secreted away and only portions have been found. When the Civil War ended, the order actually did not disband, but went underground and tried to prepare for a second Civil War, but that plan also failed. But let's start at the beginning. Harrison Horton Dodd was born in Brownsville, New York, Jefferson County on the 29th of February, 1824. Um, Jefferson County is right here, the St. Lawrence River, and right at the end of uh, Lake Ontario. He was the son of Ezra Dodd and his wife, Catherine Wood. Brownsville is located in Jefferson County, east end of Lake Ontario. Today the population is less than 6,000 and houses a number of small villages. His father married three times and had 18 children, uh -huh. most of them dying young. Of those 18, seven lived to adulthood and cons consisted of three girls, Jane, Harriet, and Maria, four boys, Alfred, Edward Scott, and John Wade, and last, but not least, Harrison Horton. John Wade Dodd lived near his brother Harrison during his time in Indiana, but it is not known if he was also active in the Sons of Liberty. Harrison Horton and his siblings were seventh generation in America. The first Dodd came into the then English colony in 1646. The name was originally D.O.D. according to the genealogy by Allison Dodd, written in 1940. Harrison's father, Ezra Buell Dodd, built and commanded the second American steamship on Lake Ontario. It was named the Brownsville after the place where it was built. Destroyed by fire on the St. Lawrence in 1828, the hull was towed to Ogdensburg where it was rebuilt and afterwards ran for four years between Oswego and Sackett's Harbor. It was renamed the William Avery. The Dodd family removed to Toledo, Ohio in 1832. And according to the genealogy, Toledo then had a population of about 20 people. Ezra's wife, Catherine Wood Dodd, died at Toledo on the 1st of January of 1833. Four months later, he married Mary Ann Carvey, an English woman. She died in 1838, leaving no children, and by 1839, he was married to Adeline Lewis. His first wife had had 14 children. No. This, at the end of the little arrow, this is the uh, Harrison Horton Dodd married Anna, Anna, Anne Maria Bradford in Toledo on the 23rd of June, 1847, and this is their marriage certificate by Charles Hay, a minister of the gospel. Oh, that's not what I want. A few years before, from 1843 to 1845, Harrison was a student at the Theological Seminary of the Diocese of Ohio, Kenyon College. Was he thinking of the ministry? 
It is not known what types of classes he took, just that he registered during those years. According to one of Harrison's obituaries, he had to quit because of ill health. Civil draft registration. U.S. Civil draft registration records dated June of 1863 list Harrison Dodd. He's right. I don't know. Right here, underlying. As a banker, Hancock County, Indiana. The 1889 enrollment of Civil War veterans shows Harrison H. Dodd was a private in Company C, 16th Regiment, Ohio. On the infantry rolls, he is listed as a volunteer who was broken down with rheumatism and collected a pension of $45 a month, undoubtedly for the rest of his life. Um, I have ordered his, uh, all of his Civil War papers, but I have not received them yet because the National Archives is really behind like six or eight months, so <laughs> I will be getting those. While in Ohio, Harrison joined the Know Nothing Party in 1855. He ran for mayor, but he was defeated. The Know Nothing Party operated in the mid-1850s. It was anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, generally taking the form of a secret society. Those who belonged when asked a question regarding the party would reply, I know nothing. Therefore, the party became known as the Know Nothings. The party tried to politically organize native-born Protestants to protect religious and political values that they believed were in jeopardy under the then current government. When Millard Fillmore became president, he had been uh, a very quiet member of the Know no Nothings, but he kept that uh, he kept quiet about his affiliation with them during his presidency. During the first year of the Civil War, Democrats were sometimes forced to take oaths of allegiance to the United States government, but Dodd avoided this. Dodd frequently campaigned against the policy of Indiana's governor, the ruthless Oliver P. Morton, as well as those of Abraham Lincoln's. As a result, Dodd started the Sons of Liberty after becoming disillusioned with the Order of American Knights an organization that was similar to the Knights of the Golden Circle, but not very organized. According to history books, Dodd was the most important copperhead in Indiana. An 1863 speech given by Dodd at Rensselaer, Indiana, convinced a Methodist preacher, Reverend Dr. Breckenridge, that Dodd was a traitor. The local provost marshal arrested Dodd, but actually didn't have the authority to do so. Local Democrats threatened a riot, and he was, and Dodd was freed with his promise that he would stop them from rioting. The Sons of Liberty opposed the draft, calling for an immediate end to the Civil War. A Secret Service agent for the U.S. by the name of Felix Grundy Stidger successfully infiltrated the Sons of Liberty and held the position of Grand Secretary for the state of Kentucky. He reported that Dodd was planning on releasing the Confederate prisoners at Camp Morton. Camp Morton was a Civil War camp and Union prison for Confederates located in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a drawing that makes the camp look quite peaceful and serene. However, 1,616 Confederate soldiers died there before the end of the Civil War. In February of 1864, Dodd stated while speaking at a convention for the Sons of Liberty, the liberation of four million blacks is a scheme that can only bring its authors into shame, contempt, and confusion. No results of this enterprise will ever be realized beyond the Army occupation. The following year, during the summer of 1864, Dodd Dodd engaged in a conspiracy with Confederate commissioners to release and arm rebel prisoners, capture arsenals, and separate the Northwest from the Union. Relying on information provided by Indiana's Morton administration, 
Military authorities raided Dodd's printing offices on the 20th of August, 1864, recovering ammunition rounds in the thousands and 400 best quality revolvers that were marked Sunday school books. <laughs> Dodd's printing house had received four boxes on the 17th and another 22 boxes on the August 20th. H. H. Dodd and Company Printing Company were, was owned by Harrison and his brother, John Wayne Dodd. Several of the Sons of Liberty were then arrested. A book containing a membership list of Sons of Liberty was found in Dodd's safe. In addition, the names of 400 rebel prisoners was also recovered. It was it was discovered at that time that Dodd was Indiana's Grand Commander of the Order of the Sons of Liberty. The New York Times picked up on this and they ran a large article regarding the raid and it was picked up by many small town newspapers. It was reported that during a convention of the Sons of Liberty of Louisville, Kentucky, a scheme was discussed among the order for the waylaying and butchering of Union Negro soldiers in the streets at night. During that same month, some members were organized for the purpose of derailing a national train of colored troops and in the confusion were to kill as many of them as possible. After Dodd's arrest, according to this book, Trials for Treason, Dodd was charged with five counts. Conspiracy against the government of the U.S., affording aid and comfort to rebels against the authority of the U.S., inciting insurrection, disloyal practices, violation of the laws of war. At Dodd's trial, testimony was given by Felix G. Steiger, a member of the Sons of Liberty. During a number of days of testimony, Steiger disclosed that an, at an, in an organizational meeting on the fourth floor Above Dodd's print shop, the following was discussed. It was part of the obligation of members of the Sons of Liberty to kill Union officers and soldiers whenever it could be done by stealth. They weren't to be caught. Loyal Union citizens who were important or influential were to be killed as well. Assassination of a Mr. Coffin a U.S. detective was discussed. He apparently knew too much about the Sons of Liberty and everyone in attendance voted yes. They discussed that there would be a meeting in Hamilton, Ohio the following day and Coffin would be there. Volunteers were asked by Dodd to go to the meeting with him. He would pick a fight with Coffin and then he would shoot him. This never took place, but it was agreed by all at the meeting that this had to be done. At this meeting, Dr. Gatling, inventor of the Gatling gun, attended as he was a member of the Sons of Liberty. Another attendee and member was R.C. Bocking, who invented Greek fire. It was a device with a timer to put on a boat or in a building which would start a fire, destroying whatever it was put into. Sounds familiar. Two boats had been an object of Greek fire at the Louisville docks. They were both destroyed. Also discussed was the main object of the Sons of Liberty. Oppose the U.S. government every way possible by force of arms if needed and cooperate with Southern forces. This was emphasized by Dodd and Bowles, his second in command. Future plans consisted of seizing U.S. arsenals and liberating rebel prisoners. The Democratic Convention was to be held in Chicago a few weeks after this meeting. It was discussed what could happen during that time. First, the rebel prisoners at Camp Morton, Camp Chase in Ohio, Camp Douglas in Chicago would be released, as would those on Jefferson Johnson's Island, where the depot of prisoners was located. Second, arsenals would be stormed at Chicago, Indianapolis, and Springfield, as the arms seized would arm the prisoners that they released. And last, all copperheads would be rounded up and armed on the 15th or 16th of August, 
Most of them would concentrate in Louisville, Kentucky, and seize that place, plus Jeffersonville and New Albany. It was at this meeting that Dodd himself stated that if the Sons of Liberty did not rise, he would leave the country, for he would be damned if he would live under such a government as the Lincoln administration. The uprising during the Democratic Convention never took place because the federal government had been tipped off by informers, and this resulted in over 100 Sons of Liberty being arrested. Among those arrested was Dodd, who was ready, who was ready with 5,000 armed supporters to march to Chicago. One of the other leaders tried to rally those left to march on Chicago anyway, but they backed out and many of them went back to Canada. Also in their plans, but did not take place, was the assassination of Governor Morton of Indiana. As Dodd's trial progressed in the first week of October, the arrest of nine more conspirators was ordered. With this new wave of arrests and evidence piling up against him, the ever-resourceful Dodd escaped the post office building in the early orders, hours of October 7th. One story has Mrs. Dodd bringing him a pie on the evening before his escape, mm -hmm. in which she had concealed a length of twine. Dodd is said to have used this to draw up a rope furnished by friends outside who assisted in his escape. This has never been verified. Dodd did, however, escape, made his way through Minnesota into Canada. Harrison Horton Dodd, chief architect of the Sons of Liberty, surfaced in Hamilton, Canada West, now Ontario. After escape, a U.S. detective reported that Dodd's hideout in Hamilton was well known, that he could arrest him and bring him home. Authorities let him be as they thought he was more valuable as a fugitive than a prisoner in the U.S. After the Civil War ended, Dodd moved to Windsor because a Confederate agent reported H. H. Dodd, north end of Frank Smith's brick house, three squares east of post office. In 1869, Dodd's two brothers-in-law proceeded to, pers to persuade him to return to the Kalamazoo, Michigan. His wife and children came from Indianapolis to join him. This is Major General Joseph Hooker. When Major General Joseph Hooker found out that Dodd had escaped, he was furious. He understood that during the trial, Dodd had been allowed to go at large on parole of honor. Hooker demanded that the officer granting it receive severe censure, especially when everyone knew that Dodd was destitute of all honor. So we don't know if the pie story with Mrs. Dodd is true. We don't know if he was allowed to go on parole of honor. But the stories are interesting. In 1865, newspapers across the country ran large articles on Dodd, including the Fort Wayne Daily Gazette and the Janesville Daily Gazette. On May 31st, 1855, President Andrew Johnson commuted the sentence of those who had been convicted to hang to life in prison. The conviction of all those who had been sentenced by the military court went through the federal courts, eventually re reaching the U.S. Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase issued a habeas corpus on April 3rd, 1866, and he agreed all who had been convicted by the military court were commuted to life in prison. Here's the Fort Wayne Daily Gazette, and they would not let go of Dodd's story. They, they printed them about him over and over again. Even after they thought he was dead, they did not think he was alive any longer. Later that year, on December 17th of 1866, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that since the civil courts were still functioning in Indiana, at the time that Dodd and his friends were convicted by military commission, 
They were robbed of their constitutional rights and they were freed under expatriate Milligan. Milligan was one of those sentenced to be hung with God. And it's, uh, his name is on there and with et al. and others. Uh, this ruled that the application of military tribunals to citizens where civilian courts are still operating is unconstitutional. The court was unwilling to give President Lincoln's administration the power of military commission jurisdiction. Justice David Davis stated that martial rule can never exist when the courts are open. It is reported that family money helped him to become head of the American Express Company in Kalamazoo. On the 9th of April, 1868, it was announced that Mr. E.L. Patch of Fond du Lac's American Express had been promoted to superintendent taking charge of the route from Chicago to Lake Superior. And one little sentence at the end of it tells it all. H. H. Dodd of Kalamazoo, Michigan takes his place as local agent. So, in 1868 and 9, Fond du Lac realized new citizens, namely H. H. Dodd and family. It's underlined there. He moved into a home on 2nd Street, and Harrison became quite social, joining local activities. This is the 1876 directory. The A behind his name means American. According to the Sanborn fire maps, his house was across from St. Peter's School, where the parking lot is now, or perhaps where the drive through bank driveway is. Now, the arrow, if you can see it, that shows right here. This is where his house was. He had quite a large lot. In 1875, one of the Fun Lake newspapers reported the following. The Republican newspapers are howling because ex-Mayor Dodd of Fond du Lac is said to have been a Knight of the Golden Circle, whatever that was. In Indiana was a delegate in the Reform State Convention, but they say nothing about the fact that two delegates in the Republican State Convention have been indicted for whiskey fraud. So he is comparing whiskey fraud to killing people. Even the Stevens Point Journal in September of 1875 brought to light that he was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Fond du Lac was oblivious. And in 1874, Mr. Dodd ran for mayor of Fond du Lac, which was certainly his right. He won. But it was the way he, won, he ran that brings into question the leopard never changing his spots. Dodd ran against the incumbent Alexander McDonald and won 403 to 296. How did he win by such a margin against an incumbent? Apparently, the day of the election, Dodd went from one tavern to the next, buying drinks and advising the people frequenting those establishments that the taverns would all be shut down if, he, if McDonald won. Almost all of those receiving free drinks hurried to vote. <laughs> the, they weren't very happy. These are the, the poll numbers. Uh, and then many editorials were produced over in most of the papers over this election, and they all seem to agree. They, Dodd's party, he is now a Democrat, never worked as they did yesterday. The schemers, the chief demagogues, spared no pains to make the saloon men and their particular adherents believe that if the Republican ticket was elected, the saloons would be closed up. Others were told that the women were ready to raid the saloons and stop the sale of beer. <laughs> I, went a, I went a few, um, 
I went a few uh, newspapers further and read this, which amazed me. Between now, this is uh, two and a half weeks after the election. Between now and the next election, there will be a special effort made to ban abandon the custom of having the polls at saloons. <laughs> Such an effort ought to succeed. A saloon is not the place for holding the elections. It is true that the sale of the stronger drinks is prohibited on such occasions, but beer flows almost constantly, and it is a sign of abject idiocy, bringing cowardice or inherent villainy in any man to say that beer don't intoxicate. At almost any time in the afternoon, on the late election, where the polls were at saloons, from 10 to 20 more than half drunken men could be seen. Common decency demands a change. Of course, this was before women could vote. The next day, and I do not, I do not have that. Um, the women of Fond du Lac apparently were quite upset with this. They wanted McDonald to win. So they ran a big column, and at the top was a chicken. And it says, and it's, this is for Mr. Uh, for Harrison, here he is, gaze upon the proud majesty of our noble bird. He is justifiably, justifiably jubilant. The truly good women tried hard to pay, pray McDonald in, but the truly better people voted him out. And it, it goes on and on to, <laughs> with quite a number of other things. <clears throat> it has not been researched what kind of mayor God was nor what, if anything, was accomplished during the year he was in office. He was not re-elected mayor again. He didn't run for the second term, but seemed to settle into becoming an admired businessman in Fond du Lac. He attended several state political conventions of the Democratic Party that he had joined, abandoning the Republican Party. But then he'd go back and he'd join the Democratic Party, and he bounced back and forth in between the two. The editor of the Milwaukee Sentinel tried to discredit God by reciting events out of God's past regarding his role in the Sons of Liberty and the Indianapolis treason trials. The fun like citizens chose to ignore the smear campaign and took God to their hearts with respect and adulation. And in 1877, he went back to the Republican Party. He attended one meeting and was made chairman. And you can see, you can see the, the different Fort Wayne and um, a number of other papers around the, the United States. They would occasionally rehash the trials at Indianapolis. And they, they did not know where he was. They didn't know he was uh, in his little yacht sailing around Winnebago. In February of 1883, the Fort Wayne Gazette picked up information from the New York Times again. Most newspaper reporters generally surmised Dodd was dead and they had no idea he had ever come back into the U.S. Even as late as April of 1893, the Fort Wayne Gazette published a long article regarding the Sons of Liberty, Knights of the Golden Circle, and H. H. Dodd. Yet they never found he was in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, enjoying his yachting. According to his obituary, this is the other newspaper, it is Finesse. Harrison was also a member of the Royal Arcanum based in Boston, that apparently provided a type of life insurance to their members. During its history, this society was semi-secretive, 
which Dodd seemed to be drawn to. Members had to be men between 18 and, 18 and 55, had to believe in a supreme being, and the rule that Mongolians, whether of pure or mixed blood, no matter what they believe, were ineligible. These restrictions have since been removed. I'm not sure how many Mongolians they've had of mine. <laughs> Uh, Gertrude Dodd was his wife, and in 1904, on December 20th, oh no, I'm sorry, this is his daughter. In 1904, December 20th, H.H. H. Dodd's oldest daughter, Gertrude A. Dodd, died and was buried in Rosendale Cemetery, where there's a number of other Dodd families that have been buried. Um, I have no idea if they're related or not. Um, something for me to search on. Um, Maria Dodd's obituary, she was the wife of Harrison. She passed away at 67 years of age on 9th of August, 1893. In her obituary, it said she did not want anyone to know how old she was. So I went to the courthouse and I found out that she was 67. She had been born in Cooperstown, New York. She had four living children at her death, Harvey B., Richard P., and two daughters. Mrs. H. E. Jacobs and Miss Jean Dodd. Both of his sons became successful businessmen. Jean Dodd was never married, but was Fond du Lac Public Library's reference librarian and cataloger for many, many years. Her children's hour had a countywide rep reputation for excellence. Dodd himself had always been in demand as an after-dinner speaker. He left no personal papers re, uh, regarding the Civil War years or any information to verify if he had accepted money from uh, the Confederate agents in Canada. He was exalted ruler of the Elks in 1902 and had helped to ex install the Elks in Fond du Lac in the 1880s. The Daily Northwestern in Oshkosh published the obituary of Dodd on June 2, 1906, and labeled him one of Fond du Lac's most prominent citizens, being ex an extemporaneous speaker. Apparently, he could lecture with little to no advanced preparation. And then we come to It is Finesse. He was a respected citizen. Uh, I hope to do more research on this mysterious man, and I will really leave it to you if he was an honest and respected citizen. As far as the gold hoards that are, um, thank you. One note regarding the supposed gold stashed across the U.S. by the Knights of the Golden Circle. In February of 2013, a hoard of gold named the Saddle Ridge Hoard was discovered on a hillside in California near the site of the gold rush of 1849. The finders wished to remain anonymous, but 1,427 gold coins were unearthed in the gold country of the Sierra Nevada, California. Face value of the coins told totaled $27,980, but it was assessed to be worth $10 million in 2013. <coughs> All coins dated from 1847 to 1894, so they were put there after the Civil War. The anonymous owners of the property discovered the trove while they were walking their dog on their property. That he there was a tin can, actually, and the man kicked, gave it a good kick, and the gold coins just came out. <laughs> Could this be one of the places that the Knights of the Golden Circle had their gold? And is there more to be found? I'm sure there is. There are several books that are just coming out on this now, both fiction and um, nonfiction. And uh, you, should, you should read them. They're really interesting. I until I found the information on Mr. Harrison, I 
had never heard of most of this information. Um, does anyone have any questions? Sure. Did he, did he have the Ku Klux Klan in Fond du Lac at that time, and was he involved at all in it? So, I don't think he was involved in it, but yes, there were, there was what they call a Klan vocation here in Fond du Lac, and it, there was a parade that went um, from about 6th Street down Park Avenue North to Division, down Division to uh, Main Street, and then Main Street out to where the fairgrounds was, which is on um, just over the, du you know, where the Dutch Gap is? Okay, the fairgrounds was on the left side. And um, that's where they had their clone vocation. And at one time, I had spoke to um, a man who remembers when he remembered when he was five years old, he was scared out of his mind because he, his dad had one of these old uh, Buick that had he could get under the dashboard, so he was hiding under there. And I was always going to interview him, and he died before I could. But yeah, we had there were over five thousand people marched in that. And that was after, I think it was after he died. It was more towards like 1914, 15, somewhere in that area. Was it comprehends the beginning of the Ku Klux Klan? No, the Knights of uh, the Golden Circle actually were, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were nasty, nasty. They killed a lot of people. I would assume that Harrison Horton Dodd killed a number of people himself. He um, did not believe that people should not be slaves. He thought that it should be, the capital should be in Havana. And that huge 2500 circle, the golden circle. And you know, that for just a few things that happened, it, they could have taken over. Yeah. And I always, as I was doing this, as I was going through this, I kept thinking of the, the quote, and I won't say it precisely, but if we are so stupid that we do not know our history, we're going to repeat it. And we will. Yes? I don't know if I got it right. Was he, did he serve in the service? Out of Ohio in for the he north? He enlisted, but that's as far as I got. But it was for the north, right? It was for the north, for the Union. And because, and you know, when I went back through his genealogy, I mean, he had people in every single war that we had. I mean, he, was a, he had ancestors in the Revolutionary War. They were here in the early 1600s. Why he did what he did, I don't know. I don't know where he got twisted, because I think he did get twisted. He's not right. <laughs> you know, and then he lived to, after being sentenced to death by a quirk of fate, he, you know, lived to yet on Lake Winnebago and die at an old, old age. So, but like I said, if we don't, if did we... When he came to Fond du Lac, did he pretty much keep his mouth shut about that? Apparently. Apparently. And if the gods in Rosendale are connected to him, they stayed away from him. They must have lived over there. And, you know, the newspapers all the way around this, Jeansville, Fort Atkinson, Milwaukee, they tried to, they put in their, in their uh, editorials, they tried to warn us, no one in Fond du Lac would, would listen. No one, there's not anything in our newspapers bad about him. Nothing. He was an upstanding citizen. Is it, isn't he buried in Ryanzi? Yes, he is. I thought I remembered that. Yeah, yeah, he's on the hill with the, in the real old section. Is there a number of uh, tombstones there for the family, too? Or no, it's just, it's just his, uh, his, Married daughter is a short ways away from him, but her, I think she's at Jacobs, okay. and she's there. 
But the boys moved on, they moved out of town. One lived in Kansas City, I think the other one lived in St. Louis. But I think if I go further, I will find that the dots in Rosendale are connected to him somehow. It may even be his brother, I don't know, I haven't looked that far. I hope, what I hope to do is, for, is uh, research this further and have another program that's more complete with more information. But the, the Sons of Liberty were nasty people. They killed anybody that was, they thought was in their way. You know, they just, just were not nice. Yes, ma'am. What drew you to his history? What, what made you think of going and then investigating and learning all about him? Uh, well, how did I do it? Well, I, I was the uh, I was the president of the historical society for a while, and one day I got an email from uh, this Kevin Deer Zimmel. He's from Beaver Dam, and he was very irate. He said, "What's wrong with the people in Fond du Lac that you didn't know you had a, a copperhead?" as your mayor, I think this is terrible. And he sent me all kinds of information, but the problem with what he sent me was that he, he had like a half a page, it would be continued on the next page, but I only got one page. <laughs> you know? And so I had to go back and re-research everything to find out what I have here. And this, this is not done, this is far from done. Um, but he, he, I put, I looked at it and I thought, oh, good grief. You know, and, and it, it, I always kept it in the back of my mind. I put it away, I bet you I had this 10 years. And finally, they needed one more speaker this year for down here. And I said, okay, I'll try to get what I can together, you know. And uh, so, but this, uh, he had, he's the one, the fellow from Beaver Dam. I don't know how he got onto this. I really don't. But it's right on uh, Wiki that there's uh, it his name. It says he served several terms as mayor of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, but he didn't. He only served one year, uh, so that is wrong. But there's a lot of information out there about him. You know, if you just plug his name in, you, you get all kinds of stuff. But I ordered books from. Um, a couple Indiana books, their history books, and he is very prominently in all of them. He was he was something, but I can't find I cannot find a picture of him when he was young. This is the only one I can come up with, and that was from the Elks. So, but it's fun it's fun researching it. Um, I have his his Civil War papers are being sent to me, but it takes like six to eight months to get stuff from the National Archives sometimes. So, uh, but as soon as I do, they'll be included in the talk again when I do give it again. So, does anyone else have any? Well, thank you very much for coming. I wish it could have been more complete, but it will be the next time I give it. <laughs> thank you.